Thank you. Okay, thank you, Deborah, and thank uh, Chuck for uh, inviting me to give uh, this uh, talk. I know that uh, we are all a bit tired at this hour, so I hope uh, this somewhat a more sexier subject will uh, lift us up. Uh, and we, we spoke earlier about the brain, so Woody Allen said that my brain is my second favorite o uh, organ. <laughs> so in this talk we are going to, to, to talk about an issue that is somewhat neglected in medicine, in public health, which is uh, male reproduction. Um, and before I start, I just want to, to, to add that we are here at the Hebrew <coughs> University. There is a, in, at the Hebrew University the Advanced School for Environmental Studies. And this is a hub where scientists from all faculties of the Hebrew Universities meet, as we, in a sense, do in this uh, <coughs> forum. And I think it's highly uh, important. <coughs> so, as anything, uh, as I was taught, everything is every presentation to three parts. I will give a brief background about this issue of environment and male reproduction, and then focus on the role of non-ionizing radiation, and uh, try to give future direction and implications uh, with uh, general, not only on, on the topic of uh, radiation and male reproduction. So why sperm? Why are we interested in sperm? So first and above all, male fertility. It takes two for a tango. We need both the males and the females, or at least the male sperm, in order to, to get a, a pregnancy for the future generation. So this is a major issue just for itself. But both the, there is a growing evidence that sperm is a great marker of men's health. There are several new court studies which show, shows that the sperm count is a predictor of mortality of men and of certain diseases. Besides that, sperm is very much influenced by the environment. So this is a great model to study the impact of the environment on human or on animal health and to promote science. The, the research in this uh, field was triggered uh, a lot by a, a seminal study published by Carlson et, et al, 1992, uh, which showed a decline in a uh, sperm count. Uh, actually, uh, during my uh, fellowship at Mount Sinai, I worked with Shana Swan and the international group uh, to do a, a, a meta-analysis on uh, sperm count, and we hope to publish the results this year. So there is a decline in sperm concentration, an increase in male factor infertility, increase in testicular cancer, increase in certain urogenital malformation, decrease in male pubertal time, and decrease in testosterone levels. In Israel, we have the same problem, also in a review that we published, we, uh, uh, the, the literature from Israel, there is a decline in sperm count, at least among uh, sperm donors, uh, increase in male factor infertility, increase in testicular cancer, and we don't have uh, good enough data on urogenital malformations. And what's interesting, and again my point is to convince you, those that are in interested in non-ionizing radiation, that a place to go is to study the effect of non-ionizing radiation on sperm. So what's interesting about sperm is that, on the one hand, it's a very good model to study uh, the developmental origin of health and disease because there is a, a pretty much strong evidence for testicular dysgenesis syndrome, which is the effect, the in utero effect, an effect on the development of male reproduction. But on the other hand, postnatal factors like endocrine disruptors, lifestyle factors, and you can add all kinds of other uh, environmental factors such as possibly non-ionizing radiations also affect the semen quality. So this is a great model both to study the long-term impact on, on uh, um, the fetus but also uh, uh, the effect later on in life and a crucial period of time is also during puberty. The male puberty during the, the uh, adolescence that's year of great change in the testes and uh, uh, which is spermatogenesis starts, so this is a crucial period of time that needs to be studied. Just a, a general overview, just to, to, to tell you the previous paradigm shift, that previously <coughs> the issue of male fertility was not studied, and during regulation of pesticides, for example, there was not much attention to this issue, and there was a great change when the workers in, in California spoke with each other and found out they, they don't have children at all. 
and, and, and epidemiological investigation in the factor revealed infertility in the male pesticide workers. This is uh, the BCP was used for uh, bananas grows. And, uh, and, and the EPA changes standard for how to test new chemicals with some aspect to, to male reproduction. So from, from that, that was in late 70s. Nowadays, there is growing evidence that the decline that we have seen for, for uh, uh, sperm count uh, uh, in humans might be related to <coughs> different environmental or lifestyle factors, such as endocrine disrupting chemicals, pesticides, heat, diet, stress, smoking, obesity, and, which I will now show, possibly non-ionizing radiation. So why, why is this spermatogenesis so sensitive to the environment? So we are speaking that uh, adult men manufactures 200 to 300 million spermatozoa per day. So that's a process that is ongoing all the time. So it is sensitive to the environment and a minor change could affect the next generation. I was asked in, in, the, uh, in the group, in the epidemiology group, so what about the, the old sites? So the old sites are pretty much saved because they are inside the body. They are uh, manufactured or produced when the female is in utero, when she, she is a fetus. And then it stayed in a, a constant phase for an entire life and, and, until the until the menstruation, etc. Et so, the spermatozoa is a, a great way for evolution to get effect of the environment on our development. The, the, the spermatogenesis itself, it's a, a lengthy process that takes 74, about 74 days, according to, to some of the studies. So, we, we are speaking of a relatively short-term uh, uh, period of time, and the, the sperm itself, is in because it's reproducing uh, very fast, the DNA is much more exposed to environmental impact. And of course, there are people here that uh, know much more than I am on the, the basic science aspect, the, the regulations inside the cell, etc. And this is a field specifically to study, to go into studying the, this cascade of the, of the sperm. <coughs> By the way, uh, uh, Segal said something like, it's easy, easy to, easily collected or something like that. I agree. I agree in the sense it's not easy to conduct such studies, of course, but in a sense, to take a semen sample, you know, it's, it's a bit of a sensitive issue, but for example, the Danish have been able to start a court study with about 20% of military candidates that are uh, giving a, a semen uh, sample for analysis, and they have an ongoing study which can be used for DNA studies, for the impact of the environment on sperm, etc., etc. So this is something we can really do in large epidemiological studies. It's possible. Now, I will not give an overview of this issue of semen quality and sperm function, but there are many, many, many different parameters. The word semen quality, we should not use it because it's ambiguous terms. There are specific parameters of the quality of the semen as a semen when we look at the overview, and we can also do functional tests to see how the, the, the semen is able to fertilize, especially that we have now IVF ongoing, we can measure, and it's, it's done clinically, how it's function in, in uh, uh, fertilizing. And also the sperm itself, we can test specific parameters in the single sperm, like there is acrosome reaction, DNA fragmentation, different aspects. So there are nowadays many, many different parameters. The classical parameters, are the sperm count, the sperm morphology, and sperm motility. Uh, uh, and we can, we can look directly at the sperm, uh, and there are different, uh, different ways to measure. So this is really a dynamic and ongoing field. <coughs> now, I want to touch on another aspect, which I also study. We are doing a, a, a large study on uh, uh, predictors of autism in Israel. And uh, one of the factors that was pretty much strongly linked to, to autism was a paternal age, increased paternal age. So, and it's probably mediated through the sperm. So the sperm, changes in the sperm are very relevant to the development of the, the growing fetus, not only if there is a fertilization or not, but also how the, the fetus will develop. So we have much focused on maternal and child health, which is of course very important, and of course the mother is more important 
for the health of the, the fetus, but also there are paternal effects and exposure of the sperm to non-ionizing radiations or to other environmental impact may not only affect the sperm now and fertilization, but may also have effects on the future uh, children. And of course, there is public concern, you may say maybe not enough, but we all, you know, we know something that putting the laptops uh, very close to, to your testicles or putting the, the cell phones in, in your pocket might have an effect on, uh, on your sperm. And we, we should at least, the very least, should attend this public uh, concern. And there were different uh, mechanisms uh, suggested, like the, it was mentioned here earlier, the oxidative uh, stress, so, and which I will show now that the studies have so far focused on motility of the sperm. There are several uh, different studies, and actually a, a meta-analysis that was published where we take the effects of different studies, even though they may be somewhat different in design, there is a statistical way to, to analyze them together, and we see here the zero means no effect, and if it's uh, no association, if there is deviation from the zero and this is statistically significant, we can conclude that uh, there is a, a statistically significant association based on the literature, and we can see that A is for the motility, there is a, a significant uh, association, while for the two other factors that were tested here, the viability and concentration, uh, uh, not necessarily uh, uh, strong or, or not necessarily significant associations. Of course, again, we can, you know, discuss the whole issue of the, the meta-analysis and how it's done, but motility is a very poor parameter of the sperm. It does not mean that many other parameters of the sperm that we are not fully measured today may not be affected. So, again, this is a field that needs to be developed and we have some direction to think that <coughs> the, the, there may be some impact. So, you know, just as we are doing in this forum, the, the one of the problems is the lack of integration of the different study methods. And we must find a way, maybe in this forum, to integrate the, and I, I put the, the pyramid upside down, because I think that the interventional studies for an exposure that is already very much existent, we may do some studies with reducing exposure. We can take men that already put cell phones in their pockets or, or use, uh, 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 or they want to be fertile. They are infertile men or men going to, to in vitro fertilization with, with the, the partners. We can do a study with reducing exposure and then we may find something which is very relevant. It will bring us very much closer to causality or increasing exposure, which, you know, that's also possible. And then again, there are observational studies, animal studies, and basic science. We should find the ways to, to combine them together. Other, otherwise, we have isolated piece of information that we cannot uh, hook together. So when I look at it from an from overview, a, 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 there are six directions. There is a paradigm shift in our understanding how the environment Im impact our health, and sperm could serve as a great model to understand this kind of non-stochastic uh, associations. We need to develop the new scientific tools. We heard some of them today, both as at exposure assessment, but also at outcome assessment in sperm and in other uh, um, tissues. Uh, there are many, many, as we start discussion in the epidemiology groups, but very complex methodological issues involved, so we, we should really address them, and we have to, to solve them somehow before we can speak about the, the results, uh, how we combine different study methods, how we study, as was mentioned here, how we study the exposome, uh, uh, and we really need, both in training, as we try to do in our uh, environmental health track at the School of Public Health, the new environmental health uh, tra track, which I, which I lead, we need multidisciplinary teams, we need to talk together. And we are doing a, a PhD workshop here, here at the Open University with uh, students from all the different faculties in, in the, the School of uh, the Advanced Schools of Environmental Studies, and we learn so much from each other as we do here at the, f at the forum. Now, I'm, I'm specifically uh, uh, very much worried about the issue of new technologies, and this slide is from, from uh, Ellie Levin, Professor Levin, my father, uh, the Wi-Fi in schools. So this is an example where 
when we measure, we measure for one router. But in school, we may have in the same class 40 routers. So the standards may be for one routers, but in one class there may be 40 routers. And that's great if they put the, 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 the laptop on, uh, on the table, but we don't know what is the Wi-Fi impact. And these are children that may later on, an uh, older child, go, go on <coughs> into puberty. So we need now to think how we study now the effect of the future, not only think about what we, the questions that we had before, but how we study the health impact of new technologies and how we assess the exposure, which, we, which is a very complex issue. So we need integration. How we integrate the exposure, the technology, the policy, and the basic science, and my paradigm is to, to put it all together through public health, but it's really a major challenge how we do it, we do it together. We, we must have people from all aspects. So for the very least in this, very, uh, in this forum, I'm thankful for the opportunity to, to learn from each other. And when we, we, what we can do, um, we also need to do it outside the forum, and not only for non-analyzing radiations. Similar questions arise for environment in health in general. So how do we combine surveillance, health promotion, and you know, giving people advice how to, to uh, live in a way that is best for the health, how we design the, the society and the environment best for the health, how we, we make research that is relevant for policy and how we determine policy with all the different factors. How we hook all of this together, I don't know. I, I think that maybe at least if we have a place which centralize the different issues, some kind of an institute, at least for Israel, you know, our strength is that we are small. So as we see now in this conference, very easily we, we know each other from other places. Maybe we need a hub for environmental health in Israel that connect the dots. It's possible to, to conduct, but it's very, it's open question to discuss here how we do it. At least some part of this, uh, this puzzle we may hear uh, from Professor Sadetsky in the, in the next talk for, for this specific issue of non-ionizing radiation. So I would like to open for questions, and thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much for your presentation that I appreciated really very much, because I think, like you, that the the study of the spermatogenesis and of the health of uh, spermatozoa could be predictive. And also selecting chemicals and physical, physical <coughs> agents for study in the long term. And we are doing that. We are working, for example, now on glyphosate, the uh, herbicide, and uh, we are working with the George Washington University. I think you know Melissa Perry. Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, yes, we are working with her on this issue. And also uh, with the University of Bologna, with the Department uh, of um, Fertility, because that is focused on the quality of food and the selection <coughs> of the new cow or what else. So they are very much, uh, they are working on, on that from 40 years with other proposals, but now they are co-working with us just to apply their method to our standards. So my, I have, I have not a question, but just I want to tell you that we are open to co-work. We are still in place all the radio frequency devices that I show you during my presentation and it is a matter of a low, very low cost to put in place. Uh, uh, Th thank you so much for, for your comment and one thing we need more international collaboration, that, that's sure. And I must say that we have, you may have seen from the many logos at the opening slide, we have a, a Hebrew University uh, excellent centers for uh, research in uh, environment, agriculture and health. And we there, this is a different subject, but also we study the impact of pesticides on sperm. There we see how complex it is because we, d we speak different language. We meet with the veterinars and with the basic science people from, 
from uh, the, the faculty of uh, the, the environment, and we see that we speak different language. So again, we must speak with, with each other. Yes. Uh, you are talking about those dangers. <laughs> I, I totally agree. This is a, a question I ask myself every day. I devote much of my time as the Secretary of the Israel Public Health Physician Association to communicate with the public. I must tell you specifically that for couples that are going to IVF and there is a male fertility problem, no one speaks with the father about smoking. So we don't need more evidence for smoking. So we are so far you know, behind what we need to do not only for non noising radiation, but even for issues that are so proven. So it's, it's very unfortunate that we live, we live in the 21st century and still things that we know we don't implement.